Please welcome Vice President, Amazon EC2 AWS, Dave Brown. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really great to be back at reInvent, and welcome to the 2022 Compute Leadership Session. It's been a great few days of the week just getting started, meeting with customers, and I'm really excited to share some of the innovation that we've been doing in Compute over the last year, and with some exciting, some exciting announcements as well. I joined the EC2 team a little over 15 years ago uh, in Cape Town, South Africa, and back then there were 14 people on the team, and I can always say we had no idea what we were actually building. It's been an incredible journey, and I was thinking back, and there's a memory that I have from November 2008, and that was the day that we actually launched our one millionth instance. And so the little incremental ID that we had inside our data store ticked over to one million instances. Well, today I can tell you that every single day on EC2, customers launch over 100 million instances. And to date, we've launched 30 billion instances on Amazon EC2. What's also true is the ambition and the drive that we had back in 2006 when we launched EC2 is still the same today, and it's driven the innovation that you've seen from EC2 in all of these years. The first is that we're looking to provide customers with tools and services that allow you to reliably and virtually run any workload that you want to bring to the cloud. And we always say we want to be able to, for you to do it on AWS and on EC2 better than you could do it in your own data center. The second thing is that we want to continuously focus on improving performance while reducing costs. And as you look at the EC2 roadmap over the years, this premise has been something that has driven us to deliver that value to you as a customer. One of the customers that we work with very closely and have worked with since 2018 when they went all in on AWS is Epic Games. And as you know, Epic developed a game a couple of years ago called Fortnite. And maybe yourselves or many of your kids, I know my kids, play Fortnite on a regular basis. And Epic needs an incredible amount of infrastructure to actually run Fortnite. And with AWS and EC2, they've been able to scale that to support their business. Every time they do a new chapter release or there's some sort of event, Epic literally needs hundreds to millions of cores that they need to be able to scale up literally overnight and sometimes with very short notice. And the scale of EC2 and the, the diversity of our instance types has allowed them to be able to run that business and do that. It's an incredible feat. The other thing they've done is recently moved a lot of their workload to Graviton2 processors, which has allowed them to save further costs while delivering that scale. In the talk today, I want to couple of, cover a few things across EC2, and I have a few guests joining me as well. First, we'll look at our world-class scale and performance. We'll have a little chapter on operational excellence, some of the things that we do behind the scenes to make sure that you have a great instance experience. We'll look at some of the workloads that customers are running. We've launched new instances as well. We'll be launching a few that haven't been launched yet. And we'll also look at some cost optimizations and best practices, give you some insights into how we actually manage costs within EC2. And finally, we'll look at some compute services where we're actually bringing compute closer to you and have a very special guest in that section as well. So we've got a lot to get through. We've got a little under an hour. Let's get going. I like story time. I think we all love to hear a good story. And uh, you know, I always like to tell some good stories. And well, when we started building compute back in the day, when we built EC2, one of the funny things is we'd, we'd get college hires into, you know, for interview loops, and we'd say to them, just draw EC2 on the whiteboard. And many of them actually got it exactly right. It was actually pretty simple. It's a couple of uh, control plane services that really just use Zen as a hypervisor. Um, and we really focused on more of the automation side of the cloud than actually some of the performance and optimization. But in late 2007 and early 2008, we started to actually see some challenges as customers brought more and more workloads to AWS. And one of them was performance and jitter. Although in the sort of common case, Zen worked really well as a hypervisor, in many cases, customers would actually see latencies and outliers at the P99 or 99.9 .9 percentile that really made it impossible to run some workloads. And this became the big challenge. How would we go and fix virtualization to actually work? And back then, everybody was talking about bare metal workloads. Could it work as well as it did in my data center? And actually, Peter DeSantis, who was in Cape Town at the time, some of you might have seen his talk last night at Monday Night Live. Peter DeSantis was in Seattle, and he met with James Hamilton. And they had this discussion around, was there something we could actually do to offload some of these things we were doing in software to hardware? And uh, James had heard about NAFA Bashara from our Graviton uh, or Annapurna organization. And, NAFA and, and uh, Na NAFA and James actually got together at this little restaurant that's still there in Seattle called the Virginia Inn. 
And as James tells the story, he said he was just going to go for one beer and talk to Napha about some of the things they were doing uh, with Graviton, and then stick around if, if Napha had a good story. And what Anapona was doing at the time is they were building some custom silicon. And so this little restaurant is actually where the Nitro story started, because James and Napha started to talk about the opportunity to actually offload some of the functionality that we were doing in software to actually hardware, and actually do that on ARM-based processes. And this is all the way back in like 2009. Super early days. Well, ultimately, we started building Nitro cards. Eventually, we realized we liked the Annapurna team so much, we actually acquired them, and they've become an integral part um, of the AWS team. And what we set out to start, the very first instance that used Nitro was actually shipped in 2013. We didn't even have the name Nitro at the time. We were just offloading network. But ultimately, over the years, and by 2017, we shipped our first fully Nitro-enabled instance. And Nitro still remains a differentiator for AWS today. No other cloud provider has anything like it. And what it basically means is we use the Nitro card to run all of our software. So all of our networking, all of our security, all of our I.O. that's going to local disks, all runs on Nitro cards. We actually use 0% of that central CPU. That's great for two reasons. One is we're not sharing time with that CPU with you at all. There's no time slicing or any sort of steal time that's happening for our applications from a security point of view. That's really good as well. But it also means that you get more of that processor. You get more of the system resources. So from a cost point of view, that's actually beneficial to you as well. So the same instance, you get more cores. We also have the Nitro security chip, which we actually built directly into the motherboard. We design and build our own motherboards as well. And the Nitro security chip actually exists on that motherboard. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. And then we built our own hypervisor. So we replaced then with a scaled-down hypervisor that runs between the hardware on the Nitro card and your application and virtualizes the machine. Incredibly performant as well. And so when you look at a server today, a Nitro server or an AWS server, really at the lower layer, you've got the Nitro cards, and they're um, providing things like security, storage, and network offload. Then you have the Nitro hypervisor that sits on top of that. And then we have your instance OS, so that's actually your application, whatever operating system you've chosen to run. And then we have your customer's application as well. Um, so no part of our software runs on that central CPU, whether it's Intel, AMD, uh, or Graviton. And we also give you some view in what does Nitro actually look like. And so these are the Nitro cards. The one on the top left is the very first Nitro card we actually got from Annapurna Labs. Um, and we've actually just launched. There are a number of them that are used for different things. Some of them are network offloading. Some of them are um, EBS and I.O. to local disks. Uh, we actually just launched our, what we call our Nitro fifth generation card. Now, there's more than five of them there. The fifth generation card is specifically focused on networking. But over the years, we've actually shipped 20 million Nitro cards across EC2, all coming from Annapurna Labs. Just an incredible story. So where does Nitro really benefit you as a customer? And in the very early days of cloud, um, we used to get special CPUs from our CPU manufacturers. And so SpecInt was actually a meaningful benchmark. If I ran SpecInt on one cloud, or I ran SpecInt in your data center, or I ran SpecInt in another cloud provider, I might get different scores. What's happened over the years is SpecInt really shows everybody's running really much, pretty much the same Skylake processor, Cascade Lake processor, uh, you know, uh, Ice Lake processor, whatever it might be. So you might not see it from a SpecInt point of view. Where Nitro really benefits you, and this is what's important to your applications, is when you think about the I.O. and the performance across the entire application stack. Because I'm not competing with you for time and cores of that CPU, you're not seeing steal time. Also, Nitro, because it handles all of the I.O. offloaded to cards, we get much better network performance, we get much better I.O. to local disks, you get much better EBS, network attached storage. And so you can see that in the workloads. You can see that for Memcached, and this is just a Memcached benchmark, nothing fancy, we haven't tweaked it. You can see we're as much as 22% faster than another cloud provider. You can see that with Nginx workloads, at scale, 16% benefit because of Nitro. And on Redis, the database solution is much as 27% faster. You know, and then you really see that benefit as you start to scale your application and push performance. So I want to dig into a few areas of Nitro. And the first thing I'm going to start with is let's look a little bit at networking and how that actually works in the Nitro environment. When we launched our very first instance back in 2006, it was actually one gigabit. Uh, and we were, we were actually pretty happy with that. We thought that it was pretty good back in the day. Uh, but you can see how over the years it's increased. And uh, 2019 was a big step forward. We went to 25 gigabit standard for Nitro cards. Um, actually, our latest generation of Intel instances and AMD and, and the new Gravitons, our sixth generation, is actually 50 gigabits per second. And then we've done some network optimized instances. And that was the first time we got to 100 gigabits per second in 2019. 
And then this year at reInvent, we've now, all of our network optimized instances for the sixth and seventh generation are moving to 200 gigabits and also seeing a significant increase in packets per second. We also launched a 400 gigabit instance uh, in 2020, and that was an instance focused on machine learning, where customers are looking to run not just a single instance, but in many cases, thousands of instances with very low latency networking between them, and they need a lot of bandwidth. So we thought 400 gigabits was pretty amazing, and we were very happy with that. And then this year, we've just announced the availability of a new Tranium instance, which is our own custom silicon, that's actually doing 800 gigabits per second on a single instance. And Peter DeSantis last night announced the availability of a, a Tranium network-optimized instance. It's pretty amazing. You need a network-optimized version when you're at 800 gigabits. Um, that'll actually be 1,600, 1,600 gigabits per second that'll be available early next year. We're also happy to announce the availability of our sixth generation, so these are our Intel instances, network optimized instances, available today. And what these instances are is providing you with the latest Ice Lake processor, but up to 200 gigabits of networking. Now that's really important if you're doing a lot of network I.O. between instances, and a very common use case, and you just had Mylan earlier talking about S3 in a leadership session, when you're trying to download a lot of data from S3. These instances will now allow you to download up to 200 gigabits per second from S3. The other thing that's a big improvement here is the packet per second. Um, that packet per second is something we've actually focused on sort of behind the scenes. We don't talk about it that much. But if a lot of network appliance type workloads or maybe analytical type workloads, it's actually packets per second that becomes the bottleneck, not actually just the bandwidth. And so what we've done here is actually doubled the packet per second. And we're getting into the many tens of millions of packets per second on these instances. The other one is we've optimized the EBS performance. So sometimes you've actually found that your connectivity through to your network attached storage on EBS at 14 gigabits maybe wasn't enough for your workload. And you said, wow, it'd be great if EBS had some more performance. What we've done with these instances is actually increased the EBS performance to 80 gigabits per second, as well as 350,000 IOPS to EBS. Now that 80 gigabits is not included in the 200 gigabits. So technically, you can actually do 280 gigabits of throughput if you maximize in this instance, 200 on the network and 80 gigabits on EBS. Incredible progress and, and fantastic work from a Nitro point of view. Next, I want to talk a little bit about storage. This is one of our newest Nitro products. Um, storage has been really challenging in the cloud in many ways. Uh, one of the hardest things to actually update if we need to de deploy firmware or do updates is actually SSDs, um, because SSD manufacturers over the time, they've always thought that a customer could just move the workload or shut off the server and apply the update. And we don't get that liberty uh, in AWS. We have to do everything live. And then when you do it live, you've got to make sure there's no, there's no stall time. There's nothing that's going to happen that will actually you'll notice as a customer if we're doing some of that. And so last year, we announced the availability of our AWS Nitro SSD. And now, including motherboards and CPUs and everything else we make, we're also making SSDs. And with the Nitro SSD, we actually provide the highest performance and lowest laten latency uh, for the S SSD space. And so with Nitro SSDs, you're actually getting up to 60% lower I.O. latencies um, just by using those on some of the new instances we've launched. You have improved reliability. Because we can go and update the firmware, we're able to actually go in and fix issues with the drives that we weren't able to do on commodity SSDs. And then finally, from a security point of view, We've also added a next level Nitro security this with, uh, to this drive with AES-256 ephemeral keys. Ephemeral keys basically mean that there's a key that's generated in hardware every time you launch an instance. No service gets to see that. It's never shipped off the drive. But as soon as the instance is terminated, the key is cryptographically destroyed, which basically means that your data is not available to anybody else, even yourself, should you come back and ask us if we, we had it for you. We're happy to announce a new feature today on the Nitro SSD to take performance to the next level, and that's Tor and Write protection. Which significantly improves database performance with our Nitro SSDs running on our i4i and some of our other instances that are using them. What Tor and Write protection gives you is, basically from a database point of view, very often you have to enable double write protection on your database, which essentially means if your machine loses power or some issue happens to the drive or the system while the write is in progress, many times that write could be lost. And with Tor and write protection, it guarantees that even under those circumstances, that write will never be lost. So from a 16 kilobit point of view, kilobyte point of view, we can guarantee that those chunks will be written to the database. And so with Tor and write protection enabled, we've actually seen up to 30% higher database transactions per second 
which is a significant performance improvement. And RDS is actually using this as well. Um, and EBS is using it as well. So you'll see some of your EBS usage, as well as your I4I, and some of your Graviton I and storage-based instances will start to see significantly better performance because we can make this guarantee about not losing those rights to the disk. Obviously, from a cost point of view as well, if you're able to turn that off from a database and you don't need those rights and we're able to give you 30% improvement in uh, transaction latencies, well, that means you can actually scale down your fleet. So there's actually a cost-saving benefit to having to on write protection as well. This is one of the first features we're launching on Nitro SSDs. It's some area we're gonna be innovating more on in the future, and we're excited to see what else we do. One of the database products that's recently been using uh, our Nitro SSDs is Aerospike. And Aerospike is a low latency data caching, high transaction volume database. And I'll tell you, like we get to work with most database platforms out there. Customers love Aerospike, and Aerospike loves SSDs. It knows how to push an SSD uh, and get incredible performance out of it. And as you can see, Srini Srinivasan, the CTO and founder of Aerospike, provided this quote to us where they said that they had actually seen up to a 70% increase in performance when they started to use AWS Nitro SSDs for the Aerospike workload. And again, that is just a, a workload that is, you know, really taxes us to actually get that performance. It's an incredible database. Um, and so we were very happy to see the performance that Aerospike got from our Nitro SSDs. Finally, I wanna to touch a little bit on security. It's such an important area. Uh, it's something that we thought deeply about when we designed Nitro. When we took this step and we said, let's redesign the way virtualization works, one of the first things we thought about is if we have to redesign security, how would we think about that from a virtualization point of view? And so, as I said earlier, we have the Nitro security chip, um, but we did a couple of things more broadly across Nitro when we designed it. The first thing is everything's encrypted. Um, you can imagine from a, you know, when you launch an EC2 instance, there's a number of control plane products talking to different parts of the system. All of that uses signed, in, you know, encrypted communication, signed keys that are only active for a period of time. We, the Nitro security chip also gives us secure boot. So any instance that launches, we're able to check the system and make sure that from a supply chain point of view, from a firmware point of view, from a software point of view, from every single part of configuration of that system, it's exactly as it should be and nothing has been tampered with. The other thing is patching. I mentioned this earlier with SSDs, but this is actually true across the whole of EC2. I've gotta be able to go and make changes behind the scenes, whether it's the kernel, whether it's the firmware, whether it's the hypervisor, and I've gotta do that at scale without impacting your workload. And we have some customers' workloads that are incredibly sensitive to latencies, and Nitro has actually allowed us to avoid doing things like live migration, to have to do an update, I can actually go in and do that update on the Nitro cards, update the firmware, update the BMC, whatever it might be. And from a security point of view, the most important thing is we designed Nitro with no remote access. We actually challenged ourselves. We said, we never ever want to be able to log into the system. You know, back in the days in the old system, you could SSH into DOM zero and Zen, or whatever it might be. With Nitro, we said, we don't want that channel. We never ever are going to build it because it means that an employee at AWS, part of the team, can never ever access a, a physical machine, I nearly called it the name we use internally, which is droplets, uh, can never access a droplet without, uh, with customer data on it. It's just not possible, we never built that. And so that's a significant improvement. And it's really helped us a lot, you know, as the world has moved towards um, what's termed confidential computing. And it's a tough term to understand because it's one of those labels, uh, a little bit like cloud was back in the day, that gets put on so many different things. But really from a confidential computer, computing point of view, you know, we, we see this as how do we make sure that AWX protects customer code and data um, from any unauthorized access, no matter where it might be, whether it's encryption on the, you know, in transit, whether it's on disk, or whether it's in the CPU, actually we're doing something, or being moved around in memory. And there's two sort of dimensions that we think about when it comes to confidential computing. And the first one is protecting you from the cloud provider. You're trusting us to run your workloads on AWS. How do we make sure that we never ever have access to that data? And I've described in a lot of detail how Nitro actually helps us do that, and we've built it in such a way to guarantee that we never have access to your data. The second one is how do you protect yourselves within your organization from other folks maybe within your organization? And the, the classic example of this is sort of your private SSL key. I'm sure many of you have battled with the problem of where do we put the private SSL key, right? You might decide you want to put it on disk, or how do I set up permissions? Then you maybe put it in a key store, like a Java key store. Well, that needs a password. Who has the password? And you sort of go through this never-ending problem of eventually you need two people with separate keys that are gonna meet at some undisclosed location with a safe, right? And you can never solve that problem of how do you actually make sure it's secure? Well, we launched a feature, I 
two years ago called AWS Nitro Enclaves, um, which actually uses the Nitro security to solve this problem. And so what it does is you can enable an enclave within your instance that actually takes a dedicated core. You can take more if you want. You can tell us how many cores you want, but they're dedicated, they're not shared, together with some dedicated memory and some dedicated storage. And you can essentially run an isolated container environment um, within your instance. The interface from the instance to the environment is actually a VSOC API. Um, and so it's actually very limited in what it can do, but you can set up your container in a way that you can effectively ask it questions. You can store PII information in there. You can store your SSL private key in there. You can ask it to generate a session key through the VSOC interface. And so you actually get, you solve that problem of having something that's absolutely secure. Um, and you know, there's some really, really get u great use cases around this. One of the first things we shipped uh, with our certificate manager service is actually the ability to do SSL keys. Uh, but many customers over the years have actually, in the last two years, have worked out really interesting use cases for this. We actually just shipped two new brand, feature, brand new features for this. One is AWS Nitro Enclaves for Graviton. We've seen a lot of adoption on Graviton, and so we wanted to make sure that Enclaves works in a Graviton environment. And we also, importantly, shipped it just today, actually, uh, for Kubernetes. And so many of you are running containers, you're using Kubernetes, you wanna make sure you can use these Enclaves within your environment, and they're very straightforward to do and integrate really well with the Kubernetes ecosystem. So we're very excited to see that out there. One customer that's recently used Enclaves in a, in a really, really interesting way is um, there's been a lot of focus around web security, right? Back in the day, everybody was using cookies to track things. That's changed significantly in the last two years. And the Trade Desk actually needed to do this um, for their application, and they were using Unified ID 2.0 solution to actually track um, customer information and, and customers so that they can provide them with a better experience. That's obviously PII information, information that they need to make sure that they treat in a very, very secure way and never has a risk of leaking anywhere. And so with Nitro Enclaves, they were able to build a solution that helped them to improve and ensure customer privacy and advertise available first party information. They're using that in an advertising feature. And it's, it's protected and secured for more data driven media buying. And so it actually solved this problem of how do I guarantee that PI information um, is absolutely secure and never compromised, not just from a cloud provider, but actually within the organization as well. It's a really interesting feature and really taking security to the next level. We spend a lot of time uh, thinking about performance, but one of the things we also spend an enormous amount of time on um, outside of features is making sure that we have operational excellence. We always encourage customers to run in multiple availability zones. We always encourage customers to use load balancing. We encourage you to use auto scaling. We encourage you to do everything you can to guarantee that you'll never be affected by the failure of a single instance. But that doesn't mean in any way that we don't spend time making sure that single instances never fail. And so I always like to say we don't want to have our head in the clouds and think that customers have got to make their systems you know, perfectly resilient to everything on EC2. We've got to continue to push and make sure that EC2 instances are as highly available as they absolutely could be. And so today I'm very excited to invite Jeremy Conley, who's a principal technical programmer within my team and spends an enormous amount of time focused on operational excellence with customers uh, to the stage to talk more about this topic. Thanks, Dave. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm super excited to be here today. So customers often frequently have a complex set of needs that they focus on as they leverage the combination of AWS services. One key thing we focus to do well at AWS in order to meet those needs is quality. In line with this, to minimize operational overhead for customers, launch times, availability, and reliability are daily touch points at AWS. And in the compute space, one thing Dave always indicates, small things can make a big difference. With compute, we often think about the data plane or instances themselves. In a cloud environment, to make sure that those APIs work for you and are operating with the specific latency is important. We're always thinking of how we can improve launch times, and in an ephemeral world, customers often are launching instances with a just-in-time mode of operation. So, as a result, AWS pays keen attention on how we can improve launch times over time but you don't have to take my word for it. As you can see here, some third-party benchmark teams have found just how consistent our APIs can be. 
in launch times and randomly scaled up thousands of instances with an open source test harness over the course of a few weeks. As you can see, represented by the orange dots here, AWS, alongside one of our competitors, the results, need I say, showed a big difference. Over just a few years, the EC2 control plane has driven an immediate improvement of 44% on all Nitro-based instance launch times, from an instance pending to running state. Continuous improvements such as adding additional caching layers in the last half of 2021 and adding workflows that operate in parallel to set up volumes and the underlying EC2 host in the first half of 2022. These efforts continue to prove our focus on exceeding customer expectations, but we haven't stopped there. EC2 control and data plane performance for Linux has seen a median improvement of 29% for Nitro-based launch ins launched instances, excuse me, from instance pending to SSH ready state. Likewise, Amazon Linux 2 has seen a 27% improvement while also seeing even better median launch time performance over any other Linux operating system. Continuous improvements such as smaller RAM disk or early boot process optimization to the interface between the instances and the EBS storage volumes have allowed us to make a big difference. Equally, Windows launch times from a pending to RDP ready state has seen a median improvement of 65% on Nitro-based instances. And with a fast launch option we released in early 2022, a customer can achieve up to 73% improvement. But as you might imagine, we simply couldn't stop there. To further improve, we've taken a quality review program that's been in existence since 2020, 2011, excuse me, and adopted metrics to further deep dive the customer experience, such as the industry known term AFR, or annualized failure rate. While the general industry defines AFR at the rate at which you replace a failed hardware component, at AWS we hold a higher bar. We actually consider a failure to be any time a customer instance behaves in such a way that they don't expect. Some examples would be spontaneous reboots, kernel panics, network card link flaps, et cetera. AWS monitors the AFR of these instances very closely, meeting each week with senior leaders such as Dave to make sure that we're achieving the desired goals and quickly addressing any regressions. Focusing tirelessly on these details has led us to achieving 62% AFR improvement over just the last two years. We accomplished this by understanding first the root cause of each issue and where root cause isn't known, working directly with our manufacturers to further isolate and assist in a path forward. Because of the scale AWS operates at, we can often identify small moves and quality trends that are not easily identifiable in smaller fleets. To further ensure customers' instances availability exceeds expectation, we're working relentlessly on maintaining fleet health and improvements through transparent maintenance technologies, such as live migrating a customer's instance to preserve a customer's workload uptime as, they take, as we take care of power and network-related network maintenance under the hood. We now live migrate well over one million instances per week on behalf of customers. So, as you can see, at AWS, we're passionate about providing a reliable experience to our customers. Excuse me, it's been great talking to you today. And I hope you can see just some of the small things that we're doing to try to make a big difference. Thanks for your time. Back over to you, Dave. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. That was great. Um, I hope you can see that in some of the workloads that you're running. And I'll tell you, from an AFR point of view, we're actually significantly bl below what we thought was possible. Uh, and in reality, nobody's actually paid this much attention to various components, whether it's disks or memory or CPUs, at the sort of scale at AWS. And when you pay attention at scale, you can actually get AFRs to a level that you never thought you would get to. And so we're very excited with where we landed. Let's take a look at supporting some workloads and some new instance launches as well. Again, we want to go back in time and let's take a look at that very first EC2 instance. 
Um, this was the very first EC2 instance. It actually didn't even have a name when we started. Um, we later, about a year and a half later, called it the M1 Small. You can still launch this today if any of you would like to use an M1 Small. It's still available 16 years later on AWS. Um, how we came to decide on these numbers was actually not that scientific. We, we literally just divided a server we had at the time into four, and that became sort of the standard instance for cloud computing. Everybody launched one of these, and all the other instances have grown from there. You know, today we have over 600 instance types um, on EC2. We just launched about another 49 or so last night um, with some of the new instance launches that just come out. And the important thing, the way to think about this is 600 is a, a big number. Many people say, well, which one do I use? Well, there's some very key swim lanes, right? If you want to need a compute-optimized instance, if you're looking for something that's more memory-optimized, you maybe need something with an enormous amount of memory. We have up to 24 terabytes of memory for some of our SAP workloads. Maybe you need a storage instance with some storage I.O. So depending on how your application works, you can very quickly go and find the instance family that would be right for you. We have a number of instance capabilities. We actually now have four processors. Um, on AWS with uh, the Graviton processor, our Intel processors, AMD. And we also recently, two years ago at reInvent, announced Apple Silicon as well. And we've just launched the M1 Apple Silicon. Uh, we have a significant other, a number of capabilities and then also options with things like uh, EBS that you can attach to your instance. So let's take a look at some of our processor types um, and what we have available in each category, starting with Intel. Intel, we've been working very closely with Intel for the last 16 years. They were one of the first or the first processor that we brought to the cloud. Um, and it's been a really, really good collaboration. We work very closely with the Intel team um, to make sure that we have processes that are suited for the cloud and suited for AWS. And obviously have the performance and availability that you would need. Today we have over 350 Amazon EC2 instances that are powered by Intel processors, um, including some of the fastest with the highest uh, all-core frequency um, running on AWS. There are some of the, the more recent instances that we launched, including the network-optimized instances that we just launched from Intel, um, and then our storage instance as well, which you spoke about those Nitro SSDs. One of the really interesting use cases is AI Scout. And actually, uh, some of you know me, and uh, what I do a lot of my weekends is I have two daughters and they are soccer players. Uh, and uh, they spend an enormous amount of time on the soccer field. And I've actually, I live stream those games myself. And so I've taken that to the next level and live streaming the game so it looks like Fox for kids sports. But uh, this is a really, really interesting use case with AI Scout. And what AI Scout is doing is they're actually democratizing the process of finding the next great soccer player. It's really challenging. There are so many scouts and coaches out there, and they can cover so much of the population. Sometimes they're incredible players that just never, ever get noticed. And so AI Scout has partnered together with Intel to actually build a new platform using the, the latest Intel CPUs, together with their Habana uh, accelerator as well, which we have available in our DL1 instance. And what they actually do is just using a cell phone and with no other tracking on the player, they're able to actually track certain drills and it's allowed them to actually work with an example as Chelsea Football Club to actually identify a few new players that they would never have been able to find before. So just incredible what they've been able to do with some of the Intel technology. In the x86 space, our next processor that we have available is AMD. And we have an excellent relationship with AMD as well. We actually launched the first AMD processor from the new Epic range on AWS back in 2018. And we've gone through the full generation of AMD processors, and we're currently in the third generation with the Milan processor. But they offer 10% lower cost versus the alternative option in x86. And so AMD is really doing well from a price performance point of view. When you have an x86 workload and you're looking to improve price performance, specifically with the latest sixth generation, our M6A, our C6A, and our R6A, Really great option to actually easily move your workload. It's immediately migratable for most applications, and you can actually take advantage of that price performance. A great example here is Sprinkler. Sprinkler actually recently moved a large part of their fleet actually over to AMD, and uh, they moved to the M5A, the R5A, and the C5A, and they were able to see significant cost savings, in some cases up to 50% for some of their workloads um, when moving over to AMD. Then finally, we have the AWS Graviton processor range. Uh, this is a set of processors that we announced, uh, our very first one back in 2018. We've iterated on that. And the one that we have now available on, on the vast majority of our instances um, that use Graviton is Graviton 2. Uh, Graviton 2 continues to provide 40% price performance benefit over alternative comparable uh, x86 options. Um, we've also improved the ecosystem, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. It's just how much we've done to make it easy for you to actually move to Graviton. 
And we also have enhanced security is all memory encryption. Every version of the Graviton processor has had memory encryption. So all of your memory is actually encrypted. It's never in the clear uh, when it goes off to memory. As I say, we have a vast network of Graviton processors that we've launched over the last number of years. And actually now, pretty much every single instance type has a Graviton option, all of them having significant cost savings opportunities. You know, the very first Graviton processor we actually launched was actually one of those processors we were using on a Nitro card. It actually wasn't the Graviton processor we were working on in building a server chip. Uh, it was actually a Nitro card C uh, CPU. And uh, we put it out there in 2018 to really spark the ecosystem. What we were trying to do is to say, Graviton's gonna be available, let's make sure operating systems, ISVs, third-party software is available. And it was incredible to see the response through 2019. And today, there's very few applications out there with operating systems um, that aren't available if you're looking to migrate to Graviton. It's actually gotten so easy that the marketing team uh, earlier this year wanted to make a point, and they decided that we should do this thing where moving to Graviton is as easy as a walk in the park. The only challenge we had with this is they gave me a bulldog. And uh, I don't know if any of you have tried to get a bulldog excited, but there was, it was quite a challenge. But uh, what we have seen is uh, moving is really simple and fast. Um, we actually had an enterprise customer that moved in four days. They went from nothing to running in production in four days. When I heard, I, I told them it's probably a little on the fast side, uh, but they were very happy with what they've been able to do. And so it's just incredible to see the progress that customers are making. And again, it's that ecosystem, it's having that software support. And in many, many cases, it's actually much simpler than customers expect it to be. I always tell customers, take an engineer or two, give them two weeks and tell them to move the application and let's see what happens. Go and do the learning. Uh, many customers get stuck thinking it's gonna be hard and don't actually move. Um, but this is really, really simple. One customer that has moved and seen really, really big example is DirecTV. We're all very familiar with DirecTV. This is their streaming application, and they've actually moved a lot of their functionality over to Graviton 2 based instances, and what they saw was up to 25% lower operating costs. So from a price performance point of view, moving over to Graviton 2 significantly lowered their costs and improved performance. And so that quote from Jonathan Tronson is VP of Software Engineering at DirecTV Stream, and just great to see um, that use case and what Graviton meant for them. Last year at reInvent, we announced Graviton 3, and this is the next generation uh, of our Graviton processor. And uh, today we have uh, two instance types that are available uh, with Graviton 3. Uh, we had the C C7G, and then just last night, Peter DeSantis actually launched the C7GN, which is our network-optimized version um, of Graviton 3. But Graviton 3 is actually 25% faster than Graviton 2. And so not only do you get that 40% boost from something like Cascade Lake, now you get an additional 25%. And I'll tell you, in many use cases, customers see significantly more than 25%. Specifically for use cases where you're doing a lot of single-threaded operations, like encryption. If you're doing SSL or any other IPsec encryption, that sort of thing, Graviton 2 uh, didn't perform as well as Graviton 3. And in those use cases, Graviton 3 can sometimes give you as high as 80% performance improvement of what you would have seen on Graviton 2. It's also the first instance in the cloud to use DDR5 memory. And so we've been running DDR5 memory now for most of the year with Graviton 3. Um, you'll start to see that on other instance types, but you know, really exciting to be doing that, giving you better performance, much more memory bandwidth. And then also super important, it's more efficient um, from a power point of view as well. One of my favorite uh, sports is, is Formula One. I've been watching it for most of my life. And working really closely with the Ferrari team and working very closely with Formula One, uh, which AWS does, has been really, really exciting. And just the performance that they get out of it has been amazing. And here you can see this quote from Pat Simmons, who they moved over to Graviton 3, our C7G instances, and actually found in their use case that Graviton 3 was 40% faster than Graviton 2, which is an enormous performance boost and saving. You know, running green and making sure that you have a small carbon footprint is so important nowadays. We're all looking to lower costs, but also trying to improve our sustainability story. And Graviton 3 is a significant step in the right direction and something relatively simple to actually do for most workloads. And so with Graviton 3, you're saving up to 60%. It uses up to 60% less energy than you would for the same workload on an x86-based instance. So just uh, amazing. We also have a new uh, carbon footprint calculator that you can actually use on AWS. It'll look at your account and it'll actually tell you what your carbon footprint is looking like on AWS and what opportunities there are to improve that, and Graviton 3 being a big one. As I said, Peter DeSantis announced a brand new instance for us. This is the C7GN. Um, and this is actually using a new version of the Graviton 3 processor. So Graviton 3 
uh, gave us a big step forward in 25% performance improvement. Uh, but we've actually launched Graviton 3E, which is a new processor as well, that actually gives you another boost in performance, um, and especially for vector workloads. And we'll talk about that a little bit more with the next use case. From a networking point of view, this uses our brand new Nitro card. So this is our Nitro V5 card that gives you 200 gigabits of networking, but also twice the packet per second throughput. So if you're looking for that PPS and performance improvement for a lot of your low latency workloads with very small packets, this is the instance that'll help you do that. And then uh, obviously the latest Graviton 3 processor giving you 25% better performance and 2x faster performance also in cryptography. You know, designing our own chips uh, has been very interesting for us for a use case called electronic design automation or EDA. When we design Graviton, we actually simulate the Graviton CPU on AWS. We actually use Graviton instances for that. And we spend months and years designing that chip, running simulations, making sure that it's gonna perform exactly as we need it to, and getting out any issues and errors. Um, and this is a really, really large workload. We do that for Graviton, but what's also happened is with EC2, a lot of the chip design companies, anybody doing EDA workloads are actually starting to run on AWS. And uh, we've seen some significant progress there. One of them we recently announced um, going all in on AWS for EDA workloads is Marvell. And you can see Rajib from Hussein from, ED, from Marvell um, said you know, that they're able to move and utilize AWS's EDA services. Um, and Marvell will be able to optimize their chip development and accelerate their time to market. And so really from a chip point of view, you wanna be able to have that capacity when you need it, run those simulations, run it at extreme scale, make sure you get all the kinks out the system, and then you go and you tape out and you, and you, and you actually go and manufacture the CPU. One of the interesting things about EDA workloads is they need very, very fast CPUs. Very often customers are paying per core licensing for these EDA workloads and the software that they use. So they wanna run at the highest possible frequency per core. And so we have a number of instances today, but we're also very happy to announce a brand new instance. And it's actually the very first instance to run Sapphire Lake, which is the latest Intel processor on AWS. And so we're available today in preview is the Amazon EC2 R7iZ instance running Intel Sapphire, uh, Sapphire Rapids, sorry, not Sapphire Lake, Sapphire Rapids. Um, and it's actually running at 3.9 gigahertz. So it's a high frequency CPU, very first SKU of Sapphire Rapids if you wanna try it out for that as well. And it gives you 15% better compute performance versus the previous generation Intel instances. And as I said, it's 3.9 gigahertz. Uh, also 40% workload performance improvements for databases, uh, video processing, and also load balancing. So one of the interesting things is even though it was designed for EDA workloads, anything that requires a license, customers tend to like these high frequency chips. So that'll include things like Oracle databases. Uh, you, if you can get more out of each core, well, it's gonna make your license a lot cheaper as well. And so being able to scale up your workloads is really exciting. So we're excited to have the R7iZ available in preview today. You know, supporting some workloads uh, is more of a journey. It takes many, many years. And one of those workloads um, that's, that's taken us a while and we've really had to work on it with many folks is, is high performance computing. Adam spoke about this a little bit in his key keynote earlier today, um, but you go back five years, and if you spoke to anybody in the HPC community, they would have said there's absolutely no way you could run on AWS. Uh, you just couldn't use the cloud. Those workloads are just too intense. There's no way that we could make it work. And over the years, we've, we've started to solve the problems technically. One of the things we did was we launched the Elastic Fabric Adapter, um, which used the new networking protocol we developed called SRD, Scalable Reliable Datagram, uh, which allowed us to reduce latencies on the network to sort of very low uh, uh, microseconds, so sort of 10, 15 microseconds of latencies between instances. We also focused on improving our performance on different instances. And you can see the, the types of workloads that customers are running here. So com computational fluid dynamics, that's the one we did with Formula One to improve the airflow around the car, which has really changed the racing um, in the 2022 season. Obviously, life sciences in the medical space, genomics, risk analysis, energy, and then obviously research as well. So just a broad array of use cases for high performance computing. Earlier this year, we actually launched the HPC 6A instance. And this is an instance powered by the uh, AMD Milan CPU, um, providing 100 gigabit of networking over EFA. And the great thing about this instance is we've been able to give incredible performance with the Milan CPU. That's allowed us to target HPC workloads, but we've also been able to reduce the cost. 
that has been the final thing from an HPC point of view in actually making it successful in the cloud is could we do it cheaper than folks could do on premise? And I'll tell you, anybody that's in the HPC game, they really understand their hardware. They know everything that goes into getting a server set up just in the way that they need it and getting the cost down. And so for us to be able to win that workload has been an incredible challenge. But with HPC 6A, we're winning a lot of those, those, those workloads now as customers are starting to move to AWS for HPC. As Adam laid it out, there's different types uh, of HPC use cases, and obviously with HPC 6A, we went in a lot of the compute intensive workloads, things like computational fluid dynamics. Um, we also recently, this was at supercomputing that happened in November, we also, the best HPC platform, that's the fifth year that we've actually received that award, um, and that's actually voted for by the readers uh, of the HPC Wire magazine as well, so we're very proud of, of that achievement. Adam announced this earlier in his, in his keynote as well, the Amazon EC2 HPC 6ID. Uh, instance. And so this is really focused at, while AMD is focused at the more compute intensive workloads, this one's focused at uh, HPC workloads that are more memory and data intensive. And so that would be things like um, seismic workloads and doing you know, analysis of concrete buildings and th uh, th those sorts of designs. And so this is a, a new instance. Uh, it's using the Intel Ice Lake processor. Um, gives you 200 gigabit of EFA networking. Uh, and importantly, it actually gives you local disks and, and a little bit more memory, which is what is needed for some of these data intensive workloads. So you get one terabyte of instance memory, which we think should have been enough, and 15.2 terabytes of NVMe storage on that instance as well. Um, and again, at a price point that is 2.2 uh, times better price performance for data intensive HPC workloads um, as you know, things like finite element analysis than comparable x86 instances. So it's really solving both the technical challenge but also the price point for HPC. And then we're also launching HPC 7G instances, and this is the first time we've actually had Graviton in the HPC space as well, again, both technically and from a price point. So 200 gigabits of networking, um, a best price performance for HPC workloads. Um, and this also uses the Graviton 3E processor, um, which is a brand new processor that offers up to 35% higher vector instruction performance, um, which is incredibly important in the HPC space. So we're pretty excited. The array of instances from our AMD HPC 6A to our Intel HPC 6ID and then our HPC 7G Graviton instance, we really believe that if you're in the HPC space, there's an instance type that should be working for your workload. I want to talk a little bit now about machine learning and what's happening in that space. Uh, we've obviously you know, been focusing on machine learning and more and more companies are using machine learning. We have a broad array of machine learning instances, everything from GPUs, uh, from NVIDIA, um, both for training and inference. Um, you know, the latest A100 GPUs are available. Um, we also have a DL1 instance from Intel Ivana. And then we have some of our own custom silicon in this space as well. Our P4DN instances, uh, we've actually recently upgraded, improved those to P4DE, E for an, an extended or enhanced, um, allows us to actually provide you with the latest A100 GPU that has 80 gigabits um, of local memory as well. And this also has 400 gigabits of networking. And customers actually deploy these in very, very large clusters for machine learning training. And in many cases, use several thousand instances and well over 4,000 GPUs um, in each of those clusters. You know, if there's one workload that we can really focus on price performance, it's going to be the machine learning space. And what we see from customers is very often the thing that's limiting them from doing more machine learning is the cost of machine learning. And they often say if they can improve the performance or get the cost down, well, they would just do more machine learning. It would add more value. They would have more insights for their customers that improve their application. And so this has been the area, and given the growth of machine learning, it's been a big focus area for us. And you know, we announced our Trainium One instance last year at reInvent, and about two months ago, we actually launched the Trainium One instance. Now, the way to think about this is if you're running on a GPU for machine learning training, and you might be using something like TensorFlow or PyTorch or MXNet as a framework, you can actually use that same framework and actually slot in a, a Trainium One instance and actually begin to run on Trainium. A Trainium, similar to Graviton versus x86, Trainium actually offers up to 50% price performance um, for things like BERT and ResNet and even GPT-3 and some of the bigger models um, over what you would get from a GPU. And so it's a significant cost-saving opportunity to actually migrate over, use the same frameworks as a layer of abstraction, but use the Trainium One instance. And so as I said, it was 50% cost to train savings over comparable GPU instances. We recently launched that, and one of the customers that's been working with us there is Halexon, and they've moved over to uh, Trainium, uh, and they actually saw significant cost savings um, from moving over to Trainium. It's allowing them to train even more models. So excited to be working with them. 
A couple of years ago, on the inference side, we launched our Inf1 instance, uh, powered by Inferentia, uh, and this did a similar thing. It actually offered up to 70% lower cost than GPU instances. When we launched that instance, actually, it was about 45% lower cost, but over the time, we actually optimized the software and the silicon and actually improved the performance, which you see a similar thing with Trainium over time as well, for these GPU workloads. We also have the same framework support, and it's also integrated with the rest uh, of AWS. We've been working very closely with Money Forward, um, and they've been building a chatbot, AI chatbot service on AWS, and they used our Info1 instance and actually reduced the inference latency by 97% over comparable GPU instances. So it's not just cost. In all these cases, they're saving significant cost. It's also reducing the latency significantly. And as Adam announced earlier, uh, we're happy to announce the availability of our Inf2 instance, uh, powered by AWS Inferentia 2. Now, Inferentia is the, the next generation silicon for inference, and each instance comes with 12 Inferentia 2 accelerators and up to 384 high bandwidth memory, gigabits of high bandwidth memory. The really crazy statistic here is if you think about these training models of having hundreds of <laughs> billions of parameters, with Inferentia 2, you can actually uh, run inference on a model with 175 billion parameters on a single instance, if you use all of the 12 Inferentia accelerators, which is just pretty amazing um, to see that scale. It does provide 45% better performance per watt than comparable GPU instances. And finally, talking a little bit about developers, we wanna make sure that we have workloads that support developers as well on AWS. And many times, uh, we actually went to customers and they said we went all in on AWS but we still have some developer workloads that we weren't able to move. We just didn't support them in the way that we needed to. And one of those was supporting Apple. In many cases, you have an organization that has to build ap Apple-based applications for iPads or iPhones or Apple TV, and that's something somebody in your organization has a pile of Mac minis under their desk that you have to time slice between engineers, or maybe it's in a data center, but time slice and provide people with time. There hasn't been a cloud solution. And uh, two years ago, we launched uh, EC2 Mac instances, and we've recently just launched the Mac One instance that provides the latest Apple M1 chip um, as, the, as the processor uh, on the Mac Mini. It's 4x better build performance and um, with 60% better price performance than we had previously on the X86 Mac instances. Um, it also, well, the customers that have moved to this have found that their, um, both their cost and their time to delivery, as well as bugs and that sort of thing, just get resolved so much faster because developers actually have access to these instances when they need them. They're not having to build on their own laptop. They're able to run more simulations. You're able to integrate, able to integrate more with the Apple ecosystem um, because you have these instances available on demand. You can just shut them down when you don't need them. So we're very excited about uh, what we've been able to do with Apple and the partnership that we've had there. Talk a little bit about cost optimization. Uh, it's really a topic um, of focus um, right now, I think for many of us, is to thinking about how do we actually reduce costs? And uh, we're all looking for ways to lower costs. And I wanted to give you some insight into what we do um, at AWS. You know, the first thing I would say is um, we have a leadership principle uh, called frugality. And uh, you know, we wanna be frugal in what we do. And the way that I describe you know, to my team is, is kind of we wanna spend money as if it was our own money not the company's money. But the other thing that's super important is frugality is a key part of any design we come up with. If you as an engineer design something and it's too expensive, well, you actually haven't solved the problem. You, you can't think about cost later in the design cycle. You've got to think about it right at the start. And so that's the first thing is we, we made that cultural. Secondly, there's tools and metrics um, that we have internally and many of them are available to you and we'll go through them shortly. And then finally, we hold our teams accountable. So with those metrics, we're able to hold our teams accountable um, to actually say, hey, are we reducing costs? What are your goals for cost reduction? Some of the things we have and available to you is you can obviously look at diversifying your EC2 instance types uh, and making sure that you have you know, things like Graviton or even AMD to reduce the cost there. We have a number of different purchasing models, things like savings plans and spot that allow you to reduce prices. And then also being able to match capacity to demand with auto scaling, uh, which is critically important. Being able to give that capacity up when you don't need it. So a lot of really good tools um, for you to be able to use. On the purchasing options, obviously I said on-demand, savings plan, and spot instances. Um, savings plans just massively adopted by customers. It's where you can make a one-year or three-year commitment and pay a significantly reduced price uh, for that, up to 60% in some cases. And the way you wanna think about it for your workload is anything that's sort of sustained usage, you want that to be on savings plans. You've got the on-demand, and then for your more optional workloads in white over there, that's where you wanna run spot instances. And spot instances, you can save up to 70, 80% on the instance type um, by just making sure that you move some of those workloads over to spot. 
Savings plans has been a big improvement as well. It's really simple. You just make a commit, a dollar commit to AWS, and you get significant cost savings up to 72%. And the other thing is, if you commit to a year and you decide to change your instance types, you can just go and change those instance types. It's no longer committing to a specific instance or in some cases, specific regions. And we've actually saved customers $15 billion since savings plans was launched, um, which is just an incredible statistic in um, what we've been able to do. Another one is Compute Optimizer, uh, which actually looks at your workload. Um, it's enabled for every single customer. We're collecting data on this. You can go in and tell Compute Optimizer to give you recommendations. And it'll actually look at your, your infrastructure and tell you, we recommend moving this instance from an M to a C, or moving this from an R to an M. Or this application is a good, good opportunity for you to save money on Graviton. And we actually use this internally. I run this across all of AWS. We look at the data, and we actually ask teams to go and implement those recommendations. We also use machine learning, so the recommendations you're getting are getting better over time. And with Compute Optimizer, uh, we've actually provided 10 billion recommendations to customers with Compute Optimizer um, for ways that they can, they can save money. And so it really is something that you've got to mechanize within your organization. We have the right tools and services that allow you to do it. I think if you're just starting, you'll find that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. There's a lot of really good options to actually be able to reduce costs if you haven't been able to think about it for a while. It gets a little harder over time, but as long as you have the right mechanisms, the right focus, and the right culture, um, you can make some really, really big progress in cost reduction within your team. Finally, I want to talk about bringing compute closer to you. And so ensuring that you have that compute where you need it. Uh, you know, AWS just has such a broad network today. We have 30 regions. We actually just launched our 30th region uh, last week. Uh, uh, in Hyderabad, and uh, we have five regions that are actually in progress right now that we've, we've announced. We've also got a new concept around local zones. Local zones is a, uh, it's not a full region, it's more like an availability zone that we actually bring closer to you. So from a latency point of view, if you need a local zone to be close to where you are geographically, we currently have 16 local zones across the US, and we've actually launched many local zones now globally. Uh, so we have four that we actually just launched in the last week, 21 available across the world. And we have another 30 local zones that we're going to be launching in those locations around the world over the coming months. So really bringing AWS closer to you. And all of that is connected to our AWS global backbone. This is a network that you know, can carry all that traffic, doesn't use the internet. So when you call an AWS service, you're actually getting onto that backbone as close to where you are as possible and then guarantee that that's encrypted and highly managed all the way back to AWS. Another offering that we launched a couple of years ago is called AWS Outposts. And this is really about what are those workloads that you might have in a data center that you don't believe you could move into one of our cloud facilities because of maybe a latency problem, uh, and it's just too far away. You need very, very low latency. Um, there could be some other, you know, maybe it's access to a lot of large data or being very close to some other system that you have. And so this is really the AWS hardware that we deploy in our own data centers that we're able to deploy in your facility, in your data center. Um, it's fully managed. And so if, if a server fails, we're actually monitoring it. You'll receive a new server. You can pull out the old one, put in the new one. And it's also, it, it behaves in exactly the same way as all of our other services. So you would use the AWS console to launch instances um, and manage that outpost uh, with AWS APIs. So it's been really, really popular. We've had a number of customers that have uh, made use of outposts, some really, really interesting use cases. Um, we've, we've had a lot, you know, even from a latency use case, we've also had a number on, of, from, from a data sovereignty point of view where it needs to be in either a specific state or country. Um, so we've been very excited. One of the customers that we've been working with very, very closely with Outposts uh, is NASDAQ. And it's been an incredible journey over the last couple of years where NASDAQ came to us. They've been, you know, they've really lent into the cloud. They've been a great customer of ours since 2008. They came to us and said, we'd love to be able to run the markets on AWS. It was a little terrifying to start with, thinking about something like NASDAQ actually running on AWS, but it's been just an amazing journey. You heard us announce NASDAQ's intention together with Adina, the NASDAQ CDO, and Adam on stage last year at reInvent. And to talk more about what we've been doing uh, with, with NASDAQ, I'm very excited to welcome Nikolai Labalestier to stage, SVP of Cloud Strategy and Enterprise Architecture, to talk more about this. Nikolai. <laughs> Well, Nikolai, it's been an incredible year of delivery, and uh, I want to thank you for joining me on stage today. Uh, well, tell us a little bit about what you do at NASDAQ. 
Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, yeah, I joined NASDAQ in 2013, and I'm currently responsible for enterprise architecture, performance engineering, and capacity planning, and focus on strategic initiatives, including enabling our cloud adoption through strategy, architecture, and a common cloud platform for NASDAQ. Well, as I said, it's, it's been quite a year, um, but before we get to talking about what we've been doing together in the last year, can you tell us a bit about the journey that NASDAQ's been taking and, and why you decided to use the cloud? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and to start with a little bit of background, you know, NASDAQ's known for being the world's first electronic stock exchange and for our equities and options markets, but our footprint extends well beyond our own markets. Uh, NASDAQ provides mission critical uh, solutions to across the trade life cycle to more than uh, 2,300 financial institutions and 130 marketplaces globally, uh, in addition to 6,000 corporates. Uh, we've been a cloud pioneer since 2008, and we've worked closely with AWS and have recognized early on uh, how cloud technology would enable us to be prepared for the future demands in capital markets. Uh, we had migrated the vast majority of our surrounding systems uh, prior to 2020. Um, but it was always a matching engine that was really the, presented the biggest challenge. And, so, and that is really the technology that turns an order into a trade. Uh, and it's really the center of the capital markets and is key to the efficient, efficient and transparent markets. So that matching engine, that was always the challenge. Can you tell us a little bit about, about the matching engine and why that was the, the biggest challenge? Yeah, and, and th that matching engine, you know, is responsible for seamlessly transacting hundreds of billions of dollars a day worth of, of transactions for millions of investors. And this is also measured in billions of messages a day. And to successfully execute that uh, and to manage unpredictable events, you know, the underlying market, in the underlying infrastructure uh, for the matching engine needs to be hyperscalable, ultra resilient, and highly performant with ultra low latency. And uh, you know, you talked a little bit about Outpost, and Outpost provided, presented a great solution for us and enables us to bring the power of cl the cloud to our clients and really heart of our, st our strategy. And over the past three years, we've worked closely with, with your team and others at AWS to really validate and finally tune the Out Outpost solution uh, to make sure that it operates under the demands of the market. Uh, and um, last year at reInvent to 2021, uh, we announced our intent to migrate our first options market, NASDAQ MRX, to AWS. And well, you know, it's easy to get yeah. on stage and make announcements. It's much harder to go and deliver. So how have we done in the last year? Well, I'm delighted to share that uh, the migration of NASDAQ MRX, one of our options markets, is well underway. And several systems are fully transacted on, on AWS Southposts and that infrastructure. And uh, transition's gone very well so far. That's amazing. Um, so what are the early outcomes you've seen? I mean, some folks said, hey, running on the cloud, is that something you can actually do as a, as a market? Uh, what have the results been? Yeah, well, and again, I think there's good news here. And really by using the highly performant and optimized EC2 instances that you know, we co-developed uh, with AWS and, and really leveraging our multicast capable, dedicated physical network, we've been able to maintain that experience and also improve on that. We measure that by the round trip time or the latency uh, order to trade. That's down in the low double-digit microseconds, uh, and we've improved that by about 10% on, on outposts. Um, you know, additionally, that gives us the ability to use uh, AWS in infrastructure on our premise in regions or you know, with our global client base in, in more than 50 countries around the world. And what are some of the future plans for NASDAQ in the cloud? Well, and we're, we are really just getting started. So we are doing our second uh, market in, in 2023, and uh, it also goes beyond our own markets. So we talked about the 130 uh, clients that we have globally in 50 countries. And uh, we see you know, a number of, of those kinds of workloads uh, that have you know, high, either highly regulated or have low latency or proximity or compute intensive workloads. And uh, we, together with AWS, we're creating a blueprint to move those workloads to the cloud. Well, Nikolai, it's, it's been amazing working with you and the team. Uh, it's been an incredible journey. Been We've a had a lot of technical <laughs> challenges we've had to go and solve yeah. together. Uh, but the results are already speaking for themselves. And I, I look forward to, to more success uh, together with NASDAQ. So thank you very much for joining us yeah. today. Thank you, Dave. Excellent. Thank you. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a really, really fun story. And uh, you know, just to end off, uh, we have many compute sessions here today uh, with members of the EC2 team and the broader AWS team. Uh, that I really recommend this list if you can find time to catch them at reInvent or maybe catch them uh, you know, online on YouTube later. Um, we, we started off with uh, 
this little guy that wanted to be a rocket ship. And, and you know, it's been a journey for us on EC2, focused on improving price performance and making sure that we provide you with the tools and services and the instance types to really be able to run any workload that you want to run on, 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 on AWS. I think the super important thing is we never allow ourselves to be comfortable with where we are, even though we've all collectively achieved so much and, and been able to do so much together. Um, we really are uh, just getting started. Thank you very much for your time.